Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crestorio 2 for part 2 of this week's update where we have a new toy that we've been playing with. Yes, uh, Mark has now finished off the uh, the infrastructure required for us to have the uh, the beam transmitters get set up in the Inkalidus orbit and that means we've now got this wandering beam of death playing around down here on Norbit just, you know, clearing out some of the biters that have been, um, that, that are kind of in the way. Now the, the glaive is great fun, but it's a little bit undirected. So at the moment, I think we're just sort of letting it ha letting it do its do its thing, have a bit of a wander around, and yeah, it, it, it's found its way over from wreaking absolute havoc on this nest down here. Although apparently it missed a little bit of it down in the corner and up here, which probably means that by the time it um, it comes back round to finish these off, they'll have completely repopulated the area. But yeah, it's uh, it's been having fun. You can you can you can clearly tell. It is quite slow at doing uh, doing the damage to the biters, as you can see. It's um, it takes it takes a while to sort of to trickle around the area, but it does do damage over a fairly large area, and it it can get through the nests quite quickly. But as we've as we've seen in the past, the the worms are a lot tougher. So in order to get this working, Mark has been out to Kalidus orbit. So that's right up here ar around the the in, in orbit around the around the star or the sun of this of this system. So he set up a large area of red solar panels and plugged them into the uh, the beam injectors that go into the chamber and then into the emitter, and that can be fired wherever it's needed. We have a second one as well, and this one is getting ready to eventually shoot over at Snowdrop, but we haven't got that one up and running yet at the other end because it's a it's a work in progress. So over here we have apparently 14 gigawatts of power available and it looks like that's not quite enough so we've, we've not got the full power required to run both of them at abs absolutely full whack but there's a little bit of expansion going, will, that will happen down here once somebody goes back over there with a the ship and, 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 and is able to build all that up again. So yeah this is coming along quite nicely. As part of getting the, um, the the beam emitters up and running, Mark has of course put, put in an area to construct all this stuff up here at the top of the um, the, ta the tower of the tower of construction. So up here we've got the um, we've got the beam the actual emitters being made, and is that that's the uh, the chamber and the injectors and the receivers as well. So all of this is being put together, and then there's a spare machine at the top for whatever the next thing we need is. And this seems to be running fairly well. One thing that's notable is we've got these. Um, these these are the the beams, aren't they? The the iridium beam is coming up the uh, the belt along here, and this is something we'd rather not be doing quite like this. We'd rather be building these down on Norvis, as I was, sort of like I was doing with the beryllium stuff yesterday, um, because then we can use the productivity modules in order to get more output for the amount of um, iridium that goes in. We're also a bit short of iridium here, probably because it's being dropped in by delivery cannon, or or um, maybe because down here there is just one machine. Okay, there's two there's two machines that are turning the ingots into plates, and that's a bit slow. It's especially for something like, like that where we're trying to make lots and lots of iridium beams out of it. So that's another reason why it would be nice to have them being shipped in, just straight in as the beams. And um, and similarly with the Holmium plates, Holmium cables here, we'd like to get all of this being built up on Norbus. But that's a sort of a few steps ahead and we need to, we need to get the spaceships up and running a bit more, a bit more completely before we can really get that sort of thing running. Speaking of Iridium, Mike has also been out on Kothar doing some um, improvements out here. The main thing he's done is put these beacons into the middle of the uh, the, pro the crushing, the pulverizing stage for the Iridium. And so he's now th these machines are now running much more quickly and they're also running a bit more efficiently or a bit more productively because we've got the uh, tier 3 prod mods in them. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as we discussed last week, we don't have the uh, the various bits of vulcanite coming in that he needs, and so he's been he's decided that the correct thing to do is just going to be to stockpile an enormous quantity of it in warehouses. And to be honest, this might be the correct thing to do. Um, it might be a good way to get this up and to get this to sort of to start playing nicely again. Now, as we discussed yesterday, I thought we had the um, heat shield tile system up and running again properly now, so we should have enough um, vulcanite being brought in. So I'm slightly curious as to why this isn't running. Oh, it's because we've got too much um, dirty iridium water, which is then being brought up to here and in theory should be being processed but there's too much water on the output right let's see if we can just ditch a load of that uh, that's a lot more than I meant to ditch intend to ditch but never mind you know what it'll do for testing purposes and so we can now clean out the irid dirty iridium water we can run it back around through the, through the system again and maybe this means it'll all kick back in again um, it may be a moment or two well while we wait for that 2000 that sort of 3000 dirty water to just pour out of this system I empty the clean side, let's empty the dirty side as well, and that will make it start working immediately and we can find out how, how the system um, now behaves. We've got the crushed iridium coming in at the top here at a nice rate. The uh, the, the uh, beads are flowing around as well. And over here we've now got the, I think I talked about this last week or possibly the week before, we've now got the uh, the recycle because these machines tend to spit out quite a lot of the input. So as you can see, there's a 50% chance of you getting your crushed iridite back and there's a 66% chance of getting the cation exchange beads back. So those need to be passed directly around like this. And I notice there's a problem 
problem somewhere here. Oh, the um, the iridium powder isn't being taken away quickly enough. So I think Mike is also going to need to upgrade all of this to blue belts in order to get more of it being passed down here to make the blast cake, uh, to make the iridium ingots and so on all the way down the line. But still, this has now kicked it back into, into motion and so things should start running. Now the thing I'm curious about is where the is where the bottleneck in this system is now. Are we going to be pulling in the same amount of um, iridium that we're passing out at the other end? And it looks like it. This belt seems to be running flat out. This belt is running also running flat out. And we can see that yes, we have 20,000 in there, 20,000 in there. All these warehouses are completely full. And so that implies that the systems over here, these pulverizing systems, are currently able to keep up with the demand over here. Now, we'll we'll see whether that continues to be the case, I guess, in the, in the future. But at the moment, it looks like the, the system, is, the system is, is happy. And over here, we've got, well, we've got nearly full belts of um, iridite coming out to be crushed. It's kind of hard to tell whether the, what, what, the, uh, what, the, what the production rate and the, and the usage rate is like. I, I'd say that... I think we're going to not, not be able to run everything quite at full speed, because I notice we've got four belts coming out here that are running fairly solidly. Um, we've got three belts coming in, plus a little dribble from the, uh, from the, from the uh, core, core system down here. So I think this is probably not quite going to be able to keep up. However, I think it's close enough that it's not going to be an issue and that we're going to have we're going to have a good flow of irid iridium coming through from here. I also noticed that now we seem to have got through the backlog of iridium powder that all these machines seem to be running as fast as they can or at the very least that these belts down here don't seem to be particularly backed up. There's still a little bit of funny business going on down here but basically the, the uh, machinery all seems to be running pretty well. What's going on there? Why is that? Oh I see it's pouring out from the bottom side as well. Yeah okay that makes sense. Uh, so this does seem to be getting through all of the um, the, the irid crushed iridite that's coming in here and turning it into the powder to then be blast caked. So yeah, okay, I, t I take it back. This system seems to be reasonably well balanced. Um, we'll we'll let it run for a while, see how it goes. Um, actually, this is now now notice notice to be draining over here. So you can see this is now down to 509 stacks, 508. So we are getting through it slightly quicker than it's coming in on at the source end, but. I suspect this is probably going to be plenty fast enough for the uh, for the rate we're getting through the iridium, um, which. But we'll we'll see as as as, as time goes on, and we'll see we'll see what the supply seems to be like and how we get on with it. So at the moment, the iridium is still being shipped out by delivery cannon over here because this hasn't hasn't been um, upgraded yet. That's I think is the next thing on Mike's to do list because he has over here he has the bottom end of a space elevator which can spit out a train that'll come. Um, which way is it going? Okay, it comes out this side, comes down here, where it'll unload the any resources that are needed, which will probably be vulcanite and maybe some other things as well. Um, I, I wouldn't like to say for sure. There's also a load of liquids that are needed, a load of fluids that are needed for um, for this actually, because I know that Mike has for quite a long time. Yes, he's had this horrible system down here where the mineral water is being brought in by delivery cannon in barrels, and that is a it's a horrible, horrible thing, but it is actually actually required because he needs mineral water here. So perhaps now he can get away from the barrel system. He can put some um, some t some t fluid tanks on his uh, on his spaceship and bring over the mineral water with that. This is presumably an iridium ingot drop. Yes, it is. So the iridium ingots can be dropped off here, dumped down here, and go into the into the uh, railway system to be taken away by up up to uh, space and then put into a spaceship, as you as you've seen with the uh, the beryllium. Um, there are various other stations over here. These all seem to be unloading stations. Do they do they have labels? No, they these haven't been set up yet. But I imagine these are probably going to be for taking away all of the other junk resources. So things like the the iron ore, the copper ore, anything that he doesn't actually need on this planet can be brought over to these stations and put it in, and, and loaded into the system as well. Or maybe he's going to drop it all off with these trains. Who who knows? Um, Mike is a. a, a uh, make, makes his own decisions and does all kinds of funny things, but he's got an array of stations here set up for dropping things off and presumably some of these are going to also be flipped around to be pickup stations for taking away the vulcanite and the other things that come in. The slightly tricky thing that he's going to need is the one you see down here, this enriched vulcanite. At the moment he's got, well he's got a belt with um, a decent amount of it on it here, but whilst we've got its big being brought over by delivery cannon, we haven't got a system set up to get it onto the spaceship. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what we're going, exactly how we're going to deal with this, but at some point we're going to need to we're going to need, we, we are going to need to keep the uh, the enriched vulcanite coming over here somehow, and then passing it down here and in, 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 into where it's needed in order to make the uh, the blast cake. 
but I'm not quite sure how we're going to do that. Maybe I'll have to redesign the uh, the system on Agnea. I'm also a little bit curious as to where all of the um, oh, no no okay it is being passed through here. I was just not doing a very good job of spotting as it is spotting it as it made its way up. Mike has also cleared out the free power system that was taking up an enormous amount of space down here. So that was the usual grow trees, turn them into biomethanol, burn them for power, which uh, produces massive quantities of pollution, but more importantly uh, causes causes massive dips to the uh, the frame rate that we're that we're able to play at. Um, Removing that is hopefully going to have helped things a little bit, and it has been replaced by the uh, the, st the standard massive solar field in in um, in orbit around the planet. That's then being squirted down the down the sp space elevator here to keep everything running. So that's basically it, it is exactly as you would expect. It's the st it's the standard system, and it yeah it, it it's it's working. The next area to talk about is back down on Norvis, where Tristan has been doing lots and lots of updates, lots of fixes, lots of improvements. Generally, he's he's been spending some time managing our resources and those sort of systems recently. So you can see over here the uh, the Graphomatron is showing a, a range of a range of numbers, should we say? Uh, we are currently apparently very very short of iron ore, and we're quite short of iron ingots. I wonder if those two are linked. Uh, we're very very short of plastic, which surprises me a little bit, but um, maybe we'll need to look into that. There's a bit of a we don't have a huge amount of metals but it's not a problem silicon and steel plates and not and, and, and steel ingots are not at their maximum but they're acceptable iron plates are okay over here we're a little bit short of blue circuits as well and we haven't been able to move over to the advanced recipes for those yet because we there's still a resource we're missing for them and we've got a bit of a shortage of purple belts but purple belts are expensive so i don't feel too bad about that i noticed that despite all the new stone mines we still seem to be short of stone so i think the new stone mines haven't been uh, properly linked into the network so that's something to have a look at next time but in general, most of our resources seem to be reasonably okay. It looks like we might need to increase pyroflux production. That, that's probably potentially linked to the uh, the lack of the lack of the iron we have over here, maybe. Um, but at the very least, I think we're going to need to boost that. Currently, it's being made over here, um, on the other miles away on the other side of the base. I've gone from down here to up here. Uh, out of out of vulcanite that's being dropped in by delivery cannon and. Yeah, that's again. This is the sort of the reason why we want to switch everything over to spaceship. If we have a spaceship turn up with fifteen hundred stacks of vulcanite and then just pour all that down in by the train load, we'll be able to run these machines a bit more, a bit more basically, and hopefully that'll help quite a lot. But at the moment, we're limited to just having these uh, delivery cannon capsules drop in from time to time like this. And yeah, it gives us a bit to play with, but it's it's not there's not as much of it as we would like to have, and that's probably why all these tanks are apparently a bit low. Yes, these tanks are completely empty. We've got a bit of with the train is virtually. Well, the train is mostly full now, but the tanks are basically empty, so we do need quite a lot more pyroflux to be put together. We are already running with tier 3 productivity modules here, so we can't do anything there. I think it is entirely down to the, the, the rate we're bringing in the vulcanite at, so we're going to need... It, it's waiting for me to build that spaceship, which is waiting for me to be able to get some space scaffolding, which is waiting for Mark to stop hogging it all, or possibly for a lot more um, heat shield tiles to be brought up, and just for the systems to build a load more of it. So it's going to be a little while, but it is very much on the to-do list. Speaking of things not being hooked up to the, uh, the the network, Tristan has hooked some oil mines up. So the the problem last week, you you might remember, we looked at the uh, the the um, the Graphitron last week, and we found that we we saw oil dropping before our very eyes. Um, and now it's completely full because Tristan's gone round and gone. Somebody didn't link, link these mines up. Let's link them up. There we go. Now it's all fine. Isn't that so much better now? <laughs> and it looks like he's probably going to have to do the same for the stone as well. He's also under the heading of resource management. He's put in some systems around um, Norbit and 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 down on Norbit to bring the uh, beryllium down. So we've got the uh, we've got the train here that will be loaded up, and presumably this is now programmed properly. So, right, yes, he's done something rather funny here with this system. So. Let's let's talk this one through. So in uh, in Factorio, if a, if a station is disabled like this one is, then when the train tries to go to it, it will just skip that one completely and it'll go straight on to the next one. So this system means that if there is a beryllium ingot drop-off station in orbit that's active, which could be perhaps over here uh, waiting for the um, wait for the astro science, it could be over here for the um, uh, for the for the bus, it could be anywhere anywhere where there's um, where there's beryllium ingots being asked for. The uh, this train will go there first. It will drop them off. And the way Tristan has set it up, and this is this is this is the clever part. If we find the the example of it, I think the only one that we have at the moment is over here. Yes, there we go. This beryllium ingot drop off. There is then a station here called Norvis Down that you can only get to if you've already been to this station. And so that means that if the train does go to that beryllium ingot drop off station, it will then go to that Norvis Down, 
and then it will go from there. It won't be able to see either of these, because these are both stations on Norvis, which means it'll then loop back round to going back round to the beryllium ingot pickup. So if there's any beryllium needed in orbit, it'll go there, and then it will come back to pick up some more. If there isn't beryllium ingots needed in or anywhere in orbit, then instead it will go over to this um, this Norvis down as part, as part of the elevator. It will go, go down the elevator, and it will end up on Norvis, where it will then pop out here, come round, 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 round this way as, as, it, as is traditional, and then it will come over to this station, beryllium ingots from space. Uh, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a trek. It'll come all the way around here. It'll then stop off here, and it'll unload here into this train, which is at the beryllium ingots from space pickup. And then this train can then head over to beryllium ingot drop. And those will be ones like uh, this one over here, where I'm making the advanced types of beryllium, so the, the, the rods and the scaffolds and the um, bulkheads. And then once it's gone to there. There's then a station in its in its schedule called um, Norvis Up, so it'll come back over here, go back up to orbit, pop back out of the elevator, and then come back round over here to pick up again. So essentially, this one is the drop off in space, and if it's disabled, and, and if it's active, it'll it'll go to the cheat station and then come back to pick up. And these two are the ones on the ground. So if that one isn't active, it'll go down. It'll then do it'll then drop them off on the ground, come back up again, and then go around to pick to, to pick up again. And this system should work really quite well. So and it'll always drop them off over here if necessary, but if not if, 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 the, if the one up here isn't requesting them, it'll go down to Norvis and drop them off down there. Now, I can see the slight potential problem with this. If we're not using beryllium down on Norvis fast enough, then it might end up down there and stuck here while this station is clamouring for more beryllium. However, I think we're going to be getting through the beryllium much faster down on Norvis because it's needed for so many more things, and we're gonna, I think we're going to be getting through it in much larger quantities, that it's going to be going round and round and round. Now, actually, that said, he has a circuit condition in here. I think this is the actual clever bit that's going to solve that problem because he's watching for a, um, a beryllium greater than zero signal coming in and I'm guessing that's going to be wired in... Okay, it's coming from the signal receiver which is called Ingots Norvis Wants. So Norvis is going to be sending a signal to up to here saying, hello, I would like some beryllium ingots, in which case this train will depart. Presumably up here in um, where, we're, where Mike is asking for beryllium ingots, there's going to be another transmitter sending the same signal out. Yes, it is. So here we have, we're, we're looking at the amount of um, beryllium that's available and activating deactivating the station as appropriate. And then here we're watching to see if we're, if we're requesting a train, then it puts out one beryllium onto this red network here that I'm going to assume is then connected in to the train system down here. Yes, here it comes and here's, here's the red cable going in over here. So that means if either of those are asking for a signal for, for beryllium, then that'll trigger the train to leave if it's full and there's a beryllium signal, and then it'll go and drop them off wherever they're needed. So actually, yes, the train is going to wait here forever until either that one or the one down on Norvis requests some beryllium. So that's done quite cleverly. It, it neatly gets to sidesteps the problem I thought he was going, he was, he was going to have there, um, and will ensure that the trains. Run, always run on time, as they say. He's also put in some of the groundwork to do exactly the same system for all of the other resources. But at the moment, the uh, the spaceships haven't been added in, the train systems haven't been added in. But on Norvis, we have the additional station. So here's one for uh, Holmium, here's one for Iridium. We're going to need similar things for Vulcanite and... Um, Possibly the beryllium th uh, intermediates as well. Uh, we, sh we, shall see we shall see what else is required, but vulcanite is definitely going to be required down here. So we'll def that, and that's probably going to be the next priority. We may even swap one of these stations over. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But vulcanite is going to be the next one that turns up, I suspect. He has also been making some preparations to head off to Snowdrop. And that's what I was talking about earlier with the beam emitter that Mark has been putting together over on, in Kalidus orbit. So you can see there's a beam receiver in there and a, um, a, a, and a space elevator. He's got a load of scaffolding. He's got some cables. He's got some railway lines. And, and so on. So he's going to be able to drop in and put down the put down the um, put in a space elevator. Maybe start setting up a um, a bit of a uh, space station for the uh, for, for sh shipping out the um, the cryonite, and then put in the infrastructure to get some trains running up and down there. And then, most importantly, put in a beam receiver down on the ground to receive the the, uh, the beam from Kalidus orbit, and then start to using that to turn water into steam, generate lots and lots of power, and then this should be. Great! It should be able should be able to produce all the power you could possibly want. Um, that's the theory, anyway. We'll uh, we'll check in in a week or two and see how it's gone. He also said I should mention that the area that was cleared out um, a week ago has another core seam in it. Oh, it seems to have been tapped. Maybe it's that one that's been tapped, or maybe it's another one. I think I might... Did I point it out last time? Maybe. Anyway, that, that one has been tapped, if that is the new one. Um, and there's and there's some other resources in here. So there's a nice copper patch there and a uranium patch. Those seem like quite valuable ones. 
Um, rest, not so much. We've got we've got an iron ore mine going in over here. Iron is definitely, as as we discussed, iron is definitely going to be needed. We seem to we seem to have a massive shortage of um, of ironing of iron ore at the moment. Um, however, we may at some point be able to go off to an iron planet in order to harvest loads of that. And this brings us on to the other thing that Tristan has been up to out here on Njord, where he's been attempting to boost the holmium output because we've not we, we've had some shortages of that over the uh, over, over the weeks, and so he says he's made some fixes to the chemical plant system over here in a in a couple of different ways. So he's replaced the loaders on this side with inserters because, like the iridium recipe I was talking about other bit earlier. These, these chemical plants output a lot of their inputs. So you, as you can see, you've got a 50% chance of the uh, crushed holmonite coming around again, and a 50% chance of the anion exchange beads coming around again. And so, this is quite clever, um, he's got the, uh, the hot, they're being, they're being passed on different sides of the belt here to go back in, that's, that's great, that's not the, not the big deal though. The important thing here is that they're now being loaded in by a loader, whereas the, 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 the fresh supply from over here is being loaded in by inserters. And that works because inserters will only load in up to, I think it's three times, in the, in the amount needed for the machine to run three times, or possibly or possibly a, number, a certain number of seconds of, of, of run time, or something like that. Whereas loaders will just keep loading until there's a full stack, or there's as much as it can possibly cram into there. So essentially, the loaders have priority, and that means we're prioritising the stuff that's being looped back round here. So everything comes out here, goes under here, and then we split off the holmonite powder which we need to take away to cook into the actual holmium, and then we loop, so everything else then loops back round. It's split into crushed and, uh, and beads and then fed back in again. Now I think with the new improved design, the, uh, the splitter here is probably not required, it could just feed straight back in again, but you know, there's, there's, if, it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and it ain't broke, so he ain't fixing it. So that then feeds back into here, and uh, and then we'll keep it topped up with the anion exchange beads and the crushed uh, holmium that's coming down here. However, he's also put in a secondary system, so apparently he ran out of inserters for this, so presumably if I scroll down far enough, and this is a ludicrously sized um, system. He says he ran out of inserters, but they seem, to be, they seem to be all the way along. Oh no, no, up here there are still loaders loading it up. So in order to fix the problem up here, he's done some compl suitably complicated uh, cable work. It, cable work. And then down here, right, yes, so over here we've got this split. The reason these splitters are here doing the sorting is so that as it comes along here, you can see that there is, is some, in fact, there's some of each on here, but this means that you won't get a jam of crush stuck behind um, beads. And over here, we're monitoring so that these belts will only run when there's less, when there's fewer than four beads or, or crushed on the on the uh, input belt over here. So that ensures that if this belt has started to back up with whatever the resource is, we won't get any more being fed in from over here. So it's doing the same sort of thing but with a slightly different a slightly different design. E it looks like either will work to uh, to solve the problem, so he's done he's done a bit of a belt and braces there to make sure everything's going to be fine. He's put some spurs out to oh yes, these two core patches over here. So there's rail Either, either rail or rail blueprint heading out to both of them. Uh, he's not put in the actual mining systems yet. Uh, the, 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 the seam is there, but all, but he's put in. He's dropped in some instructions for all of the stuff that's needed around here, and he's going to need a lot of um, a lot of uh, landfill over here as well in order to fill in the gaps here. Because as has previously been mentioned, uh, Njord is a rather swampy planet. Uh, so that's why there's gaps in the rail over here. So it's a sort of a, a multi-step process building out anything over here, especially if you do it the way Tristan's been doing it with the uh, with with uh, walking out roboports. You put down the original blueprint. You make sure that all the roboports have been put in, and maybe uh, um, then the uh, the roboports were built all the way out to wherever you're trying to go eventually. So this one's been put in, which means now a robot will be coming off out to put out put down this one. And once that one's been put in, a robot will then come out to put in this one. So you can see why it's a very very slow process. We may even be able to see the robots on their way over. There's a few there. No, I can't even see them. So it, it is a very, very slow process building out like this, but it does eventually work, and it means you can do it from somewhere completely different. You then need to go in and fill in all these patches with landfill, um, or apparently some tree issues there. So fill in all the um, all, all the little patches of water with landfill, which he's in the process of doing as well. That's that's good. And then once that's been done, you then go along again and tell it to put in the rail. So it, it, it as I say, a multi-step process. You need to go in at least at least twice uh, with a big gap between them. But but as I say, it will eventually work. Similarly, there's a, an expansion going on over here. We've put in some landfill in order to get the rails out this far and a rubber port there. And this, this is even worse. He's going to have to hop out, what, manually go out and fiddle it each time he puts in a new rubber port. So that is going to take a very long time to do. Um, but, you know, I guess he's not in too much of a hurry. Uh, and then he can pick up these extra um, seams over here. And apparently there's a few more up to the north. Yes, he's doing exactly the same thing over here. So you can here you can see the whole you can see the system in progress. Um, there are bots coming in to drop in all of the to build to build up the rail. 
Now we go one. Now now one's dropped in that pylon. You can now this uh, roboport can start charging up. Um, oh no, no, we need this pylon to be placed first, and then this roboport can start charging up. And then once it's charged up, it can then it will then extend its the roboport range up to here. So this roboport can be placed, and once all the pylons have been put, and so on, you 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 can see why it's a rather slow process, especially when you're trying to go all this this far up a planet. And that's why I tend to go out and do it myself by hand or by jetpack and jetpack and personal bots at least. However, once he gets to that point, once he's got these ones up here, he will have tapped every single core seam on this planet, uh, and so he's going to have a lot of um, holmium coming in just from the just just from the core seam mining. Uh, I, oh, he does have he does have a, a, a traditional holmonite patch over there, uh, mining patch over there. Uh, it'd be interesting to try and work to try and see how much of his holmium is coming in from um, from core fragments and how much is coming in from not core fragments. Core drop is here; they're all pouring down this way being pulverized it looks well it looks like all of the um all the holmium that's being produced is coming from core fragments oh no here, here's a dump that's just been dropped off by a train so yeah there's it is also coming in by from, from the mine by train as well um I, I i wouldn't like to say which is producing the larger quantity to be honest but it does seem to be uh, struggling a little bit and so that brings us on to the research there's not a great deal to talk about this time um we did artillery shell range three, which meant the meant the art gave the artillery a longer range. No, go figure. And we've started artillery range four. That's that. That's it. The, these are quite big researches, as you can see. This 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 one took five thousand eight hundred and fifty nine, which is a rather strange number, but that is quite a lot of science packs. Um, even though it's only material one, so we've got a good supply of those. But just churning through that many in the science labs takes quite a long time. This one is even bigger. This is seven thousand three hundred and twenty four, which is an even more ridiculous number. And the entertaining thing that happens whenever we extend the uh, the artillery range is that all of our artillery cannons get a bit more, get, suddenly are able to shoot at some biters they weren't able to shoot at before, and that's why we've been getting all of these attacks on the, the far corners of the uh, the, um, the the base. Because at the moment this is the range of the artillery, and before that happened it was probably about yeah, here maybe. And that means that when the range increased, suddenly we shelled an area here. We probably shelled a, few, a couple of nests here. We shelled a load of nests up here as well. And so sudden, and so that means that suddenly, with very little warning, you get a lot of biters running in and sort of nibbling on the corners of your base, which is a little bit unfortunate. And because we've got these sort of artillery emplacements scattered all the way around the edge of the map, we get quite a lot of um, quite a lot of response from the biters whenever whenever we do a range upgrade. Um, and so that's why there's been a lot of bleep bloop alert noises while we've been trying to while I've been trying to make this video. I've tried to sort of ignore them and stop or stop talking and wait for them to pass most of the time when they popped up. But if you've heard a few of those, then well, that's why. <laughs> Finally, the other thing to look at is the death counter, of course. Um, things didn't go too well for me this week, as I told you about yesterday. Um, I've had an extra four deaths, um, mostly due to sort of... Well, the first one was largely due to lag and hubris and just not getting away from the biters quickly enough and, and then once I got the once I got hit the first time not being able to take off again because of controller lag uh, and then the the second one was due to me being too busy looking at the menu system because I was trying to find my body and didn't notice that I'd, I'd wandered in range of a worm and got spat at so that was just sheer incompetence um, the third and the fourth ones were just trying to get back to my body and recover all, all of the good stuff that it was holding and I just wasn't wasn't doing combat very well so yeah there's been a um a nice demonstration of how not to do fighting in Factorio. <laughs> uh, turns out only one of only the one where I got spat spat to death. The second one when I was looking at the uh, when I was looking at the console was to a worm. The rest were all to biters, as you can as you can see here. So on that um, uh, worm shell, uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the videos. Make sure, please make sure you subscribe, whether you whether you enjoyed them or not. I don't know. I, I just like to get more subscribers. And please come back for the next ones. We will be back playing some more of this on Monday when I shall be attempting to go off to Agnea and putting in a, a better vulcanite processing system or a better vulcanite transport system. We'll see whether I do a better vulcanite processing system as well at the same uh, while, while I'm while I'm out there and we'll see how lazy I'm feeling. On Wednesday I shall be continuing with XCOM and hopefully I won't have the mountains of uh, technical difficulties that I had this week where just nothing seemed to work. Um, I had some some of the ones at the beginning were sort of my fault for trying to do something new without testing it thoroughly enough and then later on I had to my internet dropped and I, I, I don't accept the blame for that one. <laughs> uh, there'll be a video coming out on Tuesday where I shall show you how to do some uh, me mechanical stuff with an SLK so that's um, probably going to be of interest to all of you who own Mercedes SLKs and maybe maybe some of the others who just like seeing me messing around with cars and then of course I'll be back at the end of the week with these catch-up videos. 
So, once again, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.